Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm Alberto Fernandez from the University of Oviedo. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for being here. It's um, July the 11th, 4 o'clock. We are in Cuenca. Lovely afternoon. I come from Asturias, so we do not see sun very often. So I'm really grateful. Uh, I think you must be very, very interested in CLIL and in bilingual education. Um, I have one question before I start. How many of you uh, teach in bilingual education? How many of you are teaching in CLIL? Okay, so quite CLIL bilingual education. The rest, and you are more or less, you, most of you are uh, teachers of primary education, aren't you? Okay, just checking, okay? Right, so I have been thinking about this presentation for the last uh, weeks, um, and when I was preparing this talk, um, I was very happy because I thought that I was going to be uh, with teachers, okay? When you um, prepare these things, uh, I was thinking about something which was new for you, or something which could be useful for you, okay? When you have to give a talk to engineers, uh, doctors, uh, people who are not in education, muggles, um, normal people, <laughs> that is something different, okay? So I wanted to do something uh, for you. So, as you know, as you probably know, the, the topic is how to use subtitles in CLIP. That means how to use, how to apply audiolingual translation in language teaching, okay? And I'm going to divide this talk into three parts, very simple parts. Oops, sorry. First, I'm going to talk to you about subtitling and CLIP. Then we are going to have an example. I'm going to show you a project we developed a couple of years ago. And finally, we are going to have some hands-on activities, so practice, okay? Now, before that, I would like to start with a story. I'm going to tell you a story uh, about translation and language teaching, okay? Which is not exactly a love story. Uh, I worked in translation for some years. I was a conference interpreter and a translator. So, uh, translation is fascinating, believe me. You have an idea, but you have a message, and you have to transfer that. You have to convey that message into another culture, into another world. That is really interesting. So when I was working in translation, I got many interesting ideas, many inspiring techniques and strategies and things and insights, and I thought that perhaps these could be used and applied in the classroom, in education, in primary education, in secondary education. However, when I joined the university and I started with language teaching, CLIL, bilingual education, and all these things, I very soon realized that translation, bless you, wasn't at all popular. Translation is not popular in language teaching. In fact, it is very, very um, stigmatized. It has a bad reputation. Most teachers do not like translation. Probably there are several reasons for that, but um, I think one of the most important is, uh, I think, the influence of a very old friend of ours, which is the grammar translation method. It has grammar translation method, okay? The grammar translation method, as you know, is one of the oldest, and everyone hates the grammar translation method, okay? Because it led, or it led to very dark times in language teaching. No interaction between the student and the teacher, no interaction among students, no nothing. No use of the language, no language to learn, no nothing, okay? Now, if I ask you now, Think about translation in the classroom. Perhaps you have had some experience of uh, being a student, uh, perhaps a teacher at one point, he or she used translation in the classroom. If you close your eyes, you, you don't need to do that, okay? But if you closed your eyes and you thought about translation in the classroom, what would you think about? Think about it for a moment. You would probably Translating songs, yes. Okay. 
Okay, well, that, that's okay. But I was, I was thinking about you. When you were studying, and the teachers used translate, translation, very good. You would probably visualize something like this. Probably you cannot read it very well, but this is a typical text. So you've got final absurdo, absolute ending. And it says, eran las ocho y media de la tarde, it was 8.30 in the afternoon. Y el detective Lorenzo Fresnos, and detective Lorenzo Fresnos, and so on and so forth. Okay? This has been so for many years. So this was the use of translation in the classroom. This inevitably leads to that. <laughs> it is almost impossible not to fall asleep with that kind of thing. And this, as you know, this is the worst thing we can do in the classroom. Okay? So when I started thinking about translation in the classroom, and I went to some schools of primary education in Asturias, and I contacted friends of mine, and I told them, I have a project. Would you, would you like uh, being part of it? Would you like to try something about translation in the classroom? They told me, no, thank you. Okay, because it has such a bad reputation. However, translation in the classroom is not only parallel texts. Okay, this is what we know as literary translation, word for word translation. Okay, you take one text and you translate that into another text. As we, when I studied Latin in, in high school, that is terribly boring. Okay, and if I may, unuseful. Not exactly useful for language, for, for, for communicative purposes, for the language we need today. Okay, for the kind of language that your students need. In any case, Translation, believe it or not, can be funny. It can be funny. You're looking at me like, no, no, we can't. It can be funny, okay? It can be funny. I mean, funny. <laughs> you follow me? I'm not suggesting that you are going to do this on Saturday night. I'm suggesting that this can be used in the classroom, okay? As funny as this can be. And, more importantly, translation can be useful in CLIL, okay? 15 minutos. Rapidito, ya casi acabé. Okay? Not really, not really. Now, think about the following things. I'm going to ask you two questions, and I would like you to tell me, first, what do you know about translation? Do you know anything about it? This is something you have used in your last lessons? No? What else do you know about translation? Anything else? Okay, no problem. Second one, have you ever used translation in the classroom? Yes, no, only on Thursdays. <laughs> Tell me, have you ever used translation in the classroom? Okay, so yes. Okay, so drills, so translating drills. Okay, that is translation, yes. What else? Mm -hmm. And you use Spanish for that? I'm just, I'm just checking, okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. Because you know, why do you regret about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, but yes, we are, as teachers, we are asked to translate in many, many occasions, aren't we? Okay, you are translating uh, all the time. I'm going to do a very simple uh, activity, because you know that this is one of the best, or one of the most relevant principles in CLIL. You learn by doing, okay? In CLIL you have to do things by yourself to learn how to do them. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to do a very short activity on translation, okay? Now, this is going to be the first one. Uh, for this, I'm going to, which was your name? Maria Ángeles. Maria Ángeles me va a ayudar. Sí, 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 sí. Maria Angeles is hyperventilating right now. Okay, I'm sorry about this. 
I, I'm, I'm really sorry, okay? Okay. Well, that's true. What, what's your name? Antonio, would you help me for a minute? It's very easy, very easy. Yo os voy a explicarla, ya cansé. Voy a explicaros la actividad en español y Antonio la va a traducir al inglés, la va a interpretar. Very good, very good. Well, you could, you could put it the other way. So, Alberto is going to, to explain the activity and I'm going to... Okay, very good. Perdón, que dije que iba a hablar en español. ¿Es difícil? ¿Por qué? I can, I, can, I can promise, I haven't thought about that answer. It is not prepared. Believe me. Very, very good. Uh, ahora te van a preguntar todos los profesores, porque das juego. ¿Sabéis que lo peor que puede...? You know that the worst thing uh, a student can do is to... Somehow, in any way, call the teacher's attention because then he's going to ask you. No, I'm not, I'm not. This is a very stupid thing, I know, but it works. I have tried this with many people, believe me. So, this is what I would like you to do. I would like you to work in small groups, three, four people, no more, no less, okay? One of you is going to talk in Spanish for one minute. The second student is going to interpret everything into English, everything the first one says, he has to interpret into English. And the third one can just be a mediator, if you want. He or she can ask questions. You can talk about anything. Cuenca, Clil, The Weeknd, Game of Thrones, Donald Trump, anything. <laughs> In fact, believe me, the less academic, the better. I mean, if you are talking about your hobbies, your husbands, whatever, it would be great, okay? I would like everyone, everyone to interpret for one minute. This is, by the way, for those of you who don't know it yet, this is the difference between translation and interpreting. So translate, translation, sorry, is written. Interpreting is when you transfer the message orally. Okay, you have um, consecutive interpreting, which is what we were doing now. You talk, you stop, and the person renders the message. And you have simultaneous interpreting, which is when you need, of course, a headset for that, and you are uh, listening to the person. Okay, so just relax. This is just a game. Okay, I'm not going to ask anyone to bring, you, you can relax. I just want you to talk, okay, in Spanish and in English. Three, four people, all right? Five minutes or so.
you more or less? Have you finished more or less? Sort of. Okay. Um, this simple exercise was just an icebreaker. Okay, I just want you to wanted you to relax a little bit and use it. So tell me, how was it? Was it easy, difficult, boring, extremely boring, extremely boring? You say, no, difficult, difficult. How many of you think it is difficult? The rest, you don't think it's difficult. I mean, it, it, it should be, it should be. And it does not relate to your language competence in English. Okay, you can have a very good level of English. You can command English and still find it very difficult. Why? When you interpret and get the idea, but if you want to mm, translate every single word or every expression, that's the difficulty in the expression. Remarkable. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. When you translate or when you interpret, like uh, the exercise you have just done, um, you do not have to transfer every word, okay, word uh, for word. You have to convey a message. You can change things. It doesn't matter. You are not professional translators. You are not going to be translating a book. Okay? So you can change things. The important thing, the, most, the objective, is that you convey, you transfer the message. All right? Uh, it should be difficult. Why? Because we are not used to it. So you are not used to this code switching. Okay, perhaps if you have experienced the typical situation where you've got some foreigners in your city, you have to go to a restaurant, you have to order the menu, that is exhausting, really. If you spend one or two days with people from abroad at the beginning, that is very tiring. You, you feel tired because English is not your native tongue. It, it will never be. Okay? So you have to change and you have to translate. Now, when we go into audiovisual translation, which is what I want you to do today, you would probably, or you will probably think about this, a tele, a television set, audiovisual translation. But this picture is no longer useful because audiovisual translation today is more like this. So you have computing, you have, ta uh, you have tablets, you have phones, etc. You have digital information, okay? In audiovisual translation today, you do not translate films, you translate everything, video games, Netflix, everything. And this is the world of your students, as you know. They, uh, the other day, let me tell you, it has nothing to do, but I want to tell you this story. The other day I was uh, at the faculty and I listened to two girls, they were talking, and one told the other, Jodia, es que se están del 2013? Están del 2013. So yes, I mean, films and all that things, they live in a different world. They live in a different world, okay? So, they use, we are dealing with audiovisual multimedia products. Why, this is no, no, nothing new to you, or it shouldn't be, I mean, it's no surprise for you. Um, we use, or we should use audiovisual multimedia products. Why, in the classroom, why? First, because they are motivating the video, but all these things, they are very motivating for your students. That is the first thing. They love it. They like it. And Dornier, Chomsky, many people said that. A teacher has to keep motivation. That is our primary goal. If they are motivated, they learn. If they are not motivated, they don't. Okay? So motivation. Second one, they are close to the students. They love, yes, this uh, Frozen and all these things. They love it. Okay? So it is very close to their world. Third, it is real language. Yes, it is an adaptation and all that, but it is real language, okay? Videos and all that. And something which is close to clear, it is full of cultural elements. Bless you. Full, welcome. <laughs> full of cultural elements, okay? Now, when we come into subtitling, I'm going to show you a definition which is provided by Jorge Diacintas, who is from Albacete, very close from here. He's the most 
Are you from Albacete? Okay. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read that, okay? But the thing is that, that subtitling is a written representation, representation, not the actual thing, not word for word, of the dialogues in a film. Okay, so you have to try to capture the message. And you, as you know, use it normally, you place it on the bottom part of a screen, okay? Now, if you want it, if you become crazy one day and you want it to know about subtitling, there are two books that you have to read. One of them, you don't need to copy anything because you will have this available in five minutes, okay? One of them is uh, Audiovisual Translation, Subtitling by Jorge Diaz Cintas and Alan Remael. And the second one is probably more didactic, is by Noah Talaban from the uh, UNEF, okay? Who used subtitling for teaching purposes. Okay, so you can just read these two books and you will know a lot about translation and subtitling. But I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you need to know. First, you know that there is a split, there is a separation between subtitling and dubbing. Okay, we have been a, a, a dubbing country. Everything in Spain was dubbed. Okay, doblaje, just in case. In Spain, everything is dubbed. Okay, subtitling countries, for instance, Sweden, the Netherlands, uh, have normally a much better command of foreign languages. Dubbing countries don't. That's a problem, okay? Nowadays, they do not have an excuse. They do not have an alibi. They have Netflix, they have YouTube, they have everything. When I studied, I didn't have such a thing. I didn't. You, you needed to go to uh, England and, yeah, well, speak up, yes, yes. Or, or you had to go to the UK. Many years, well, not many years ago, a few years ago, okay? <laughs> so dubbing versus uh, subtitling countries. Um, which countries do you think are dubbing countries, apart from Spain? Italy, 